Now, most of you will be familiar with the, uh, the archetypal detective story, which will always start off with some crime or some great mystery. And the story that follows is how the detective will follow the clues and eventually solve the case. Uh, and we would tend to call it a whodunit. But in the 1970s and the 1980s, there was a famous television series called Columbo. And Columbo was an inversion of the whodunit. It was a how catch em because it started with the crime being committed and you saw who the perpetrator was. And the plot was then how Lieutenant Columbo was going to solve the case. So quite a different premise. Now we've got something a bit like that at the start of Ruth 2 where the narrator lets us in on a secret right from the outset. Verse 1. Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side from the clan of Elimelech, a man of standing, whose name was Boaz. So that we have this powerful, wealthy man in this area, a man of noble character, a real man of standing, only just happens to be related to Elimelech. So this is great news. Here is someone who is going to be an advocate for, for Naomi and for Ruth. Now obviously Ruth wasn't aware of this at all. And perhaps Naomi had forgotten or overlooked it. And as far as they are concerned, as Ruth goes out into the fields to search for grain, she's totally at the mercy of random luck. Who's she going to encounter? Is someone going to respect her and show her mercy or... Is someone going to abuse her? It's up in the air, who knows? I imagine Naomi spent an anxious day worrying about her daughter-in-law. Will she even return in the evening? And yet we as uh, readers have no such anxieties for Ruth because right at the beginning, the narrator has revealed his hand. Now, it's not necessarily the best storytelling device, is it? Why would you spoil the surprise? Well, I think what the narrator is doing is giving us a framework within which to view everything that follows. Because it means that when in verse 3 we read, As it turned out, Ruth found herself working in a field belonging to Boaz, we know straight away that it's not just random luck. This is God providentially at work. And we know that in all things he works for the good of those who love him. And therefore we know straight away that this is going to be a story for us to savour. It's a story of divine grace. There is a redeemer in the promised land and this is going to be the story of how Ruth alone and vulnerable meets her redeemer and because we know in advance the outcome in that sense we can savour it and we can enjoy the, the glorious inevitability of what happens. Well what does happen? Well, last week we left Naomi and Ruth just as they've returned to Bethlehem from a faraway land. Well, okay, Moab wasn't quite a faraway land. It was only 50 miles to the east. It's about the same as travelling from Birmingham to here. But culturally, theologically, of course, it was a faraway land. It was pagan Moab. They worshipped a pagan god, Chemosh, who had human sacrifices made to him. It was a totally different place. And now, Naomi and Ruth are back in Israel, back among God's covenant people, and that should have made all the difference. Only as we know, this is the time of the judges. This is a time where people just do what they think is right in their own eyes. And so as we all find out, Israel was not an idyllic safe haven for, for vulnerable people. And vulnerable well, that's what Naomi and Ruth most certainly are. Naomi is a childless widow. Her security in life had been in her husband, and after he died, in her two sons who carried on the family name. They provided for her. Now, who has she got? No one. No one of means. She's probably in her 50s, so she's unlikely to remarry, and she's beyond childbearing age. And therefore, she has no security and no future. She's without means. She is friendless, helpless, hopeless. Now her only companion, Ruth, at least has one thing going for her, although she is a childless widow as well, 
she's evidently still a young woman of childbearing age. Problem is, she's not a child of the covenant, is she? She's an alien from pagan Moab. Now, the, the law of Moses prescribed compassion towards the widow and the orphan and the alien, but, as I've said, this is the time of the judges. So can Ruth expect anything? Now, that's the, the situation. That's the nuts and bolts of the situation that Naomi and Ruth find themselves in. Evidently, they found some accommodation, but it's not going to do them much good if they can't eat. Something has to be done. And so Ruth, the younger, the fitter of the two women, isn't about to sit at home bewailing her misfortune. Now, I'm sure we all know, don't we, how tempting it is when we're beset with difficulty and, and trouble to sink under it. And as Christians, we can maybe use our theological brains and we can say, oh, I think the Lord's against me. This, the Lord's angry with me. Which is more or less what Naomi has said in chapter 1. The hand of the Lord has gone out against me. But Ruth, however she felt, and we don't know how she felt because we're not told, she just gets out and goes on with it. She says to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favour. Now, it's not just the, the right attitude, it's a courageous attitude because she doesn't know who she's going to meet in those fields. She doesn't know how they're going to respond to her. It may just be that ignorance was bliss. Ruth simply had no knowledge of these parts. Perhaps she was naive, but I think also it's a bold step of faith because Ruth, as we know from chapter 1, has committed herself to Naomi's God and to Naomi's people. And so now almost, almost like a child with their parent, she simply places herself in the care of that God and, it, and his covenant people. It, it's childlike faith and dependency on the Lord. And I think we can learn a lot from that in, in the cynical sophistication of the, the day that we live in. I think we're apt to overthink things at times and to get entangled by fear and doubt and we can live in an idealised past or we can live in unrealistic dreams of a, a future that may never happen uh, and Ruth is, is a great example because she just lived in the now and she stepped out in simple faith and it's at this point at this point in verse 3 that we get this interesting turn of phrase as it turned out as it turned out, she found herself working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech, that very same man of standing that we've already been pre-warned about. So, no cause for alarm, Ruth is going to be safe. And as we know, of course, it's not luck, is it? As it turned out, is the narrator's ironic turn of phrase. He really wants us to see that there's a, a bigger picture, a higher purpose here. Because of all the fields in the vicinity of Bethlehem, Ruth has ended up in that field, in the safe haven of Boaz's field, the field of grace. And why has that happened? Well, the God of grace is at work. Now, of course, as far as Ruth is concerned, from her perspective there and then, there was nothing inevitable about it at all. And as far as we're concerned, as we live out our lives day by day, there's nothing inevitable about what happens to us. But this chapter shows that if you love God and trust in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, you are under his grace, you are under his tender care for you. And it is inevitable, whether it feels inevitable or not, that he will take care of you and look after you. Our job is to leave the ordering of our circumstances to him and to step out in faith and simple trust which is sometimes easier said than done well Ruth's presence in the field doesn't go unnoticed the landowner arrives Boaz and we immediately get a, a feel for the kind of man he is he's not a hard-nosed tyrannical taskmaster who's hated by his workers. I'm sure you all know what it's like to work for somebody perhaps that you secretly despise and also fear and your heart sinks 
when they enter the room, you think, oh dear, I'm going to have to talk to them again. Now that wasn't the case in the harvest fields of Boaz. He arrives, the boss enters the field, he greets his workers, the Lord be with you. And they reply, the Lord bless you. It's a touching scene of mutual respect between employer and employee. And what's more, amidst this time of darkness, the time of the judges, in this little corner of Israel, the Lord's name is honoured. Which again tells us something about the kind of man that Boaz was. Clearly he's no ordinary run-of-the-mill Israelite. He is a landowner and he has many servants. He's a wealthy man of means. And he clearly hasn't got that far by being unobservant. He quickly sees that there is a stranger in his field. Who does that young woman belong to, he asks. She's not one of his servant girls. She wasn't anyone he recognised in that local area. Why is she there? Who had sent her? Well, the foreman explains who she was. She is the Moabite daughter-in-law of the recently returned Naomi. And he also explains what she's doing. Early that morning, she'd come in and she'd asked for permission to glean, to, to pick up all the surplus ears of grain that the harvesters had dropped, but perhaps if we put it another way, to pick up the scraps. Now this was actually something provided for in the law of Moses, because in Leviticus 19 farmers were instructed not to be greedy and reap to the very edges of their field, swallowing up every single gleaning, but they were to recognise the needs of others and to deliberately leave them. For the, for the poor and for the alien because that's the kind of God God is a God who cares about the poor and the struggling a generous God and so that was provided for in the law of Moses so what Ruth had actually been doing was legal she wasn't trespassing and she certainly qualified to do this she wasn't trying to um, pull a legal loophole over the eyes of Boaz she was poor she was an alien but what must have impressed Boaz was that, first of all, Ruth hadn't insisted upon her rights. She'd sought permission from the foreman. And second, she had stuck at her task. She'd worked steadily through the day. And perhaps most of all, what had stood out was Ruth's courage. Because this was the time of the judges, and just because God's law prescribed something did not mean God's law was adhered to. And Ruth didn't know whose field this was. Anything could have happened. We don't need to use our imaginations to guess. And yet she'd gone out and she gleaned. So it's no wonder that Boaz is keen to meet Ruth and seeks her out. Although I should add, there's no hint of romance here, is there? Boaz was probably just about old enough to be her father, which explains this rather paternal uh, phrase, my daughter. And it's also clear that although he didn't recognise her, because he'd never met her before, he had heard quite a bit about her, because he tells her as much. I've been told all about what you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. You see, Boaz was an honourable and God-fearing man, but he was accustomed to living alongside many who were neither of those things and were Israelites in name only. And he must have been astonished to suddenly meet this Moabite girl who was more Israelite than many Israelites. Like Abraham of old, she'd given up everything she knew because of the call of faith. Faith in God's covenant people, faith in the covenant God himself. But Ruth, for her part, she's also astonished. Here is this powerful man of influence and standing who could just decide there and then that her face doesn't fit and have her kicked out of that field, or worse. And yet all she can hear from his lips are words of kindness and grace. Don't go and glean in another field. Don't go away from here. Stay here with my servant girls. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the girls. I've told the men not to touch you, and whenever you're thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have just filled. And to get a, a sense, 
of how extraordinary these words are, just have a listen to what the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 2 verse 11. Talking to the Ephesian Gentiles, he says, Remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, foreigners to the covenant of promise, without hope and without God in the world. And that described Ruth's status as a Moabite, an excluded foreigner, without hope and without God in the world. And yet here is Boaz treating her with dignity, with respect, as if she were an Israelite. And in both Ruth and Boaz here, we do see a lovely Old Testament foreshadowing of God's gospel grace, where if you belong to Christ by faith, then you are Abraham's seed and you are heirs according to the promise, regardless of ethnicity or gender or rank or class. Now, it's not just a, a matter of Boaz's words which are so striking because his actions speak as loud as his words. At mealtime, Ruth is not expected to sit on her own with a packed lunch somewhere. She's invited to join Boaz and the other harvesters. Hospitality is extended. Bread drip, dipped in wine vinegar. Roasted grain. It's a hard-earned feast for this tired woman. And Boaz also gives his workers strict instructions. Don't embarrass her. Don't rebuke her. And if you put the two together, it basically means don't threaten her physically and don't undermine her psychologically with snide little comments here and there. And Boaz is very ahead of his time. As one writer says, this is the first anti-sexual harassment policy in the workplace. And it happened 3,000 years ago. But then to cap it all, Boaz orders his workers to deliberately leave extra gleanings on the ground so that Ruth has all she needs. Not in an obvious way, not to patronise her, but to care for her. And boy, does Ruth have all she needs at the end, because she comes home that night with what amounts to between 30 and 50 pounds of grain, which was the equivalent of several weeks of food for the average harvester. I'm surprised she managed to carry it home, or drag it home probably more like. It's a reversal, isn't it, of Naomi's story in chapter 1. Naomi went away full and came back empty. Ruth, on the other hand, she'd gone out empty that morning and she comes home with abundant supply. It, it, it is boundless generosity and grace poured out so lavishly and so unexpectedly. In her wildest dreams, Ruth couldn't have expected this when she went out that morning. But when her mother-in-law hears about what had happened and hears about the identity of the man, well, Naomi is not quite so surprised. In all the emotion and all the pain of her homecoming, perhaps she had overlooked Boaz, her husband's relative, no longer. And it suddenly dawns on Naomi that Boaz is not going to merely be a steadfast friend who can perhaps help her and Ruth with the provision of food. He could be far more. What does she say? That man is our close relative. He is one of our kinsmen redeemers. Now back in Leviticus chapter 25, the, the, the Mosaic law stipulated that the nearest of kin would guarantee the security and rights of his fellow kinsmen. So he could perhaps avenge his relative's blood or reclaim and restore his property or free that relative from slavery if they'd fallen into debt and in some circumstances he could even marry the widow and provide children and heirs for the relative who had died childless and therefore Boaz has this covenant obligation to look after Elimelech's family now, we're in chapter 2, so we're only halfway through, 
So clearly it wasn't quite as straightforward as that, it was messy. Real life often is messy. As we'll discover, there was another man in Bethlehem who was a closer relative than Boaz and therefore had a greater obligation. And also, what if Boaz didn't want to get involved? I mean, Ruth was a foreigner, and though the Moabites weren't in the same category as the accursed Canaanites, marrying a Moabite? Hmm. Wasn't the done thing, really. So, at this point in the story, there are lots of potential stumbling blocks. Doesn't matter. Not for Naomi, because her and Ruth know there is a Redeemer in the Promised Land. There's hope for us in the Promised Land. And as readers, of course, we're not surprised, are we? Because the cat was let out of the bag back in verse 1. There is a man in Bethlehem. He will be an advocate for, for Ruth and Naomi. This man of standing, this relative of Elimelech, Boaz. And of course, as I said at the beginning, it is God providentially at work, working out all things for the good of his people. Three times in verse 2, 10 and 13, the word favour is used in my NIV Bible and it's another word for God's grace. God's unmerited favour. Boaz was God's appointed man, his means of grace towards Ruth. And I think Boaz himself realised that there was something bigger going on here. He saw the Lord's hand all right, because in verse 13, he says these beautiful words. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Now allow me just to, for a moment to share an illustration that I have used before from an old Baptist theologian, Dr John Phillips. So forgive, forgive me if you've heard this one before. But Dr Phillips wrote about a mission station in the heart of Africa. And one day, a forest fire swept through the bush, leaving death and destruction in its wake. After the flames had subsided, one of the missionaries took a walk down one of the trails to, to look at the havoc that had been wrought by this fire. And suddenly he noticed a tiny nest by the side of the road and enthroned on the nest he saw the charred remains of a poor mother hen and without thinking the man just kicked the poor heap with his foot and to his astonishment out from under the burned blackened carcass ran some baby chicks they'd found refuge from the flames beneath the feathers of the mother hen and just like that mother hen in the Angolan forest, Boaz says that God is the mother bird, so to speak, who spreads his wings of strength over his people to protect them. I mean, we sit here today in this church building, and as far as I know, we're all Gentiles, we're not Jews, and uh, we're all sinners, I think. I think I can speak freely there. And yet we can enter the Lord's presence and we haven't been destroyed. Why? Well, it's because God has appointed a redeemer for us. The Lord Jesus Christ. God's wrath against our sins fell on Jesus. And whoever hides themselves in Jesus and trusts in him alone is hidden from the blazing wrath of God's anger against sin. Because at Calvary it fell on Christ once and forever. And in him we have an eternal refuge from the flames. And to trust in Jesus is to be transferred and to journey from Satan's cruel kingdom of sin and darkness. Where everybody does what they think is right personally. Where everybody is a slave to sinful passions. Where nobody is enduringly happy or truly at peace. And no one is ever really safe. And to be transferred into the glorious realm of God's grace. Where our sins are forgiven, the condemnation is removed, where we're given unspeakable joy and peace that passes all understanding and where we're safe for all eternity as Christ's bride. That's the journey that we've all made if we're believers. And it's the journey that Naomi and Ruth had made. Naomi the backslider, Ruth the Gentile, the pagan. 
from the faraway country of the dark paths of sin, they had returned through many dangers and toils and snares to the land of grace. And I'm not merely talking about the physical land of Israel, because in truth, Israel wasn't much better than Moab. After all, it was a land where the safety of a young woman in the harvesting fields couldn't be taken for granted. But as Boaz, I think, is acknowledging, it wasn't merely a physical journey, was it, from one country to another. It was a spiritual journey, like the one that we have been on. They had come to the true Israel, to God himself. They had sought refuge under his wings of grace. And that is why they were therefore safe. Because in grace, God had prepared a a redeemer to advocate for them and to save them and to keep them. And so I think Naomi is quite right, isn't she? Ruth must stay in that field. Because outside of Boaz, in someone else's field, well, someone might harm you. So if, if I could modernise what Naomi is saying here, it's Ruth, don't get cocky. Don't be complacent. Don't become entitled. Don't wander from the place that God has put you. Stay where you are in the field of grace. Stay in Boaz's field and don't stray from grace. And I think that's our call as believers and whether you're new to the faith, whether you've been walking the road for for decades, don't stray from grace. You see, some believers act as if grace were merely, you know, a past tense, one-off thing, I was saved by grace, but the rest of it's more or less down to me, isn't it? And that's wrong. Because we live and we breathe and we have our being as Christians in the sphere of God's grace. We're very vulnerable people. Because we're citizens of God's kingdom and we're living in this sinful fallen world with the devil and the world and our own flesh and all sorts of things could go wrong and down to us they will go wrong. And yet God's grace is lavish and it's continuous and it is poured out every day to meet our needs and more. What does Paul say in Philippians 4? And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Now, I suppose we could apply that narrowly and temporally to things like our food and shelter, paying the rent or the mortgage, maybe the Lord bringing us through a daunting hospital appointment or or course of treatment or helping us with a job interview or whatever. But it also applies to our emotional and our spiritual needs, doesn't it? It's God's boundless, unmerited favour to us that enables us to persevere as Christians. When when left to ourselves, we'd have given up long ago. It's God's grace that lifts us when we're down, that overrules our stupid mistakes, that sanctifies us and reshapes and remoulds us into Christ's likeness, a thing that would seem impossible to us, And it's God's grace that will keep us all the way through to the gates of paradise. From first all the way through to the last, it's always a matter of God's grace. So we mustn't stray from grace. We mustn't get cocky or complacent and assume, well, you know, I'm secure. I'm doing pretty well in my own strength. I know lots of stuff now. We mustn't become entitled or proud and think we we should have great things from the Lord all the time. We mustn't get itchy feet and uh, wander from the calling and the responsibilities of spiritual life in Christ, which I think we're all liable to do. It's easy to get bored by being a Christian because it's not as exciting as perhaps you thought it would be, and to seek the the new thrill of of a brand new teaching or some new experience a new field. But of course, if you're not in the field of God's grace, you're in the field of Satan. And you will be harmed in that field. So I think the enduring lesson for us is don't stray from grace. Grace is wonderful. And we'd be lost without it. Stay in the field of God's grace. Stay close to the Redeemer, to the Lord Jesus, who loves you and gave his life for you.
and will take you to be with him one day. Amen.